CYC is a free channel that presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Welcome everyone to our next session in uh, Evolution and Creation series. Uh, thanks for being uh, with us. We have our friends here, Monica and Rogi and Miriam and Tedros. Why don't you tell us where you're from? I'm from the Church of the Virgin Mary, St. Athanasius in Mississauga. I'm from St. Philippa Mercurius in Guelph. I attend the Church of St. Mary and St. Athanasius in Mississauga. I'm from St. Philippa in Guelph as well. Great, so Guelph and Mississauga. That would be in Canada, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Don Waller, and I'm pleased to be your host for this session. Thanks for coming. So we're talking about evolution and creation, and specifically in this session, we're talking about the Bible and how does it relate to what scientists tell us about the creation of the universe and the earth. I'm a volunteer apologist with Reasons to Believe, which is an organization that specializes in science and faith issues. An apologist is basically somebody who defends the faith. So that's what I try and do, is defend the reason why I believe in God and uh, why I believe that the Bible and science fit together so well. So we've been talking up till now, we're up to day five in creation. And in our last session we talked about God creating a whole bunch of different kinds of animals and how it was a bara creation, meaning it was a brand new creation. It, he didn't create it from something else, he created it brand new. And we talked about the Cambrian explosion. So at this point, we just want to—I just want to highlight a couple of points to remember. First of all, Genesis is just giving us the basics. Okay, it's never intended to go into great detail. In one of our previous sessions, I talked about how the Bible is not a science textbook, and we should never try and bring that kind of approach to the Bible. But having said that, we'd be surprised if the Bible wasn't accurate, or at least fits in with what we see in science, because we believe that the Bible and nature both came from the same Creator God, and so it should fit together. It should not be at odds. The next thing is, is that the minor or the non-players in this story as it unfolds are not mentioned. Have you noticed, for example, that there's no mention of bacteria? There's no mention of dinosaurs, which would have been created during this day five. Insects. There's no mention of sea sponges or starfish or octopi. None of that is mentioned specifically. Okay. But here's what is mentioned, and this is very important because it's kind of where we're going to go with this series. And that is that all our needs are mentioned. The things that keep us alive are mentioned specifically. It appears that this book, Genesis, and the Bible, in fact, was written for anyone, anywhere to understand. Because the basic message of Genesis is, I created all these things to meet your needs so that you could have a relationship with me. All right, so let's carry on with our story here about animals. Okay. Reading from chapter 1, verse 24, God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. When we look into the record of nature, what do scientists tell us? Well, they tell us that about 350 million years ago, animal life took off on land. We had this Cambrian explosion, which was largely confined to sea creatures. But 350 million years ago, we see land animals starting to grow in large numbers. And in fact, they grew so great that by about 50 million years ago, scientists refer to it as the age of mammals, the age of mammals. And we now see these large quadrupeds, large livestock type creatures. Um, I grew up in, or didn't grow up, I lived in South Africa for many years, and I can tell you, we used to go out in the bush and see all these different kinds of buck. It was just amazing. There's like so many different kinds. I mean, here in Canada, we go out in the bush and we're glad if we see a deer. 
But when you go into the bush in South Africa, there's like hundreds of different kinds of antelope type animals. So we see them, we see different kinds of livestock creatures, sheep, goats, cows, etc., and animals that stayed low to the ground, like rodents and rabbits, which are potential for clothing and for food. As politically incorrect as that may be, that's what animals were good for before we were able to make our own clothing. Wild animals, some of which could be tamed and even domesticated, some that were used as beasts of burden, horses, for example, and cows, and others like that, were useful to man who had yet, not yet been created, useful to man in order to work the ground and produce food. All right, so if we look at the comparison between Genesis and the record of nature, we see that these advanced animals are relatively recent in terms of the history of planet Earth. They didn't start at the beginning. It was later on. Genesis said so. Scientists are telling us, yep, that's exactly the way it happened. Okay, so let's summarize where we are so far. What have we got? Well, we have life-supporting air. We have a stable water cycle. I think we talked about that in, in uh, session two or whichever one it was. We have plants. We have land. We have a visible sun, moon, and stars. We have sea life. We have birds. We have potential beasts of burden, livestock, food and material for clothing, and shelter. Hmm. I wonder where it's going to go next. Everything is now set for God's creation of humans. Okay, so here we go. Let's read from chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now, here's the third time that the Hebrew word bara is used. It's used for the creation of mankind, a brand new type of physical being, something the earth had never seen before, a spiritual creature. The Lord made... There's two words there. It says that he made man and he created man. The one is the word bara, which means it's a brand new creature, but it also says he made us, right? Which fits in with what it says in Genesis, that he made us out of the stuff of the earth. It says the dust of the earth, but we understand that to mean the stuff of the earth. He used pre-existing material to make our physical bodies. So he forms something from existing materials, our physical stuff, but we're unique and different in the bara sense because we're made in his image, the Bible tells us. Okay? So I just want to explain that. Now, when I was growing up, when I was a young man, young men used to look at women and they used to say, man, is she ever built? And they didn't know they were being scriptural because that's exactly what God did. He made man and he built woman out of man, we read in Genesis, right? So that was meant to be a joke, but obviously I'm older than you guys. All right, so let's look at the record of nature. What has it got to say about human beings? All right, about 30 to 50,000 years ago, 30 to 50,000 years ago. Now, these dates are, are not exact, but they're definitely in that sort of uh, era. A new species, a species rather, appeared on the planet that would change things dramatically and forever. And these new creatures were utterly unique, okay? They questioned their existence. How many of you have seen Stonehenge? Have you ever seen a picture of Stonehenge in England? Yeah? Um, they displayed evidence of some kind of a moral conscience, an ability to know right from wrong, not just instinct, not just driven by instinct, but actually being able to choose between something that's right and something that's wrong. They showed concern over death and afterlife. They were able to manufacture tools made with tools. Okay? They had complex art, language, and music. They seem to have, as well, an awareness of God. And this picture that you'll see on, on the screen is, is actually a picture of the School of Athens that was painted by Raphael around about 1510. And in this painting, 
you see two figures in the center. And the one is Plato, where you can see that he's pointing upwards because he's emphasizing to the second person, who is Aristotle, that what's important is the ideals, the concepts, the principles, the higher things. And Aristotle is arguing with Plato, and he's saying, no, 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 what's important is the physical things. And he's pointing down. He says, what's important, no, no, is the details, the particulars, the stuff of our existence. And this is a famous painting because it really portrays many of the philosophical arguments that you hear going on even today. In fact, it's very familiar. Is it just this world? Is it just this physical existence? Or is there something bigger, something above us that's, that's important? And so this was captured by Raphael in this famous painting, The School of Athens. So this, these new beings on the earth had an awareness of God, and they exhib exhibited a desire to worship God. They also had a desire to discover truth. And this creature, of course, we know as Homo sapiens, or modern man. If we compare Genesis with the record of nature, we see that man is an utterly unique being and is last to appear on the scene. So, again, we see this incredible harmony between what the Bible says in terms of the order of creation and when man appears on the earth and what science tells us. We've not been here for very long. In fact, in geologic time, we've been here for a very, very short time. So the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and science agree on that point as well. So if you've been listening to me all this time, you'll notice that there's this harmony that seems to exist between Genesis 1 and the record of nature. So I'll take some questions, and then we'll bring this session to a close. So who'd like to ask the first question? Um, how does like the whole like God created man, but with the whole like the cavemen, mm -hmm. like I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it like they they as people like they're they're different like their skulls were shaped differently and mm -hmm. everything, so how does that work with the whole like man isn't like us? Right, it's a great question. Where do all these other sort of what we call hominids where do they all fit in? And it's a good question because obviously we can see in the fossil record that there were these creatures. Uh, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, you've probably heard all the different names. Um, these, these creatures were created by God as well, part of that animal creation that he did. But there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that it isn't until mankind came on, onto planet Earth that all of these attributes were exhibited. There's this burst of uh, music, of um, art, uh, all of these things all seem to be associated with Homo sapiens, not with any previous animals. There were some rudimentary ones. There is evidence that some of these creatures did do some of them in a primitive way, but nothing like uh, mankind. And, and this sort of burst of what we call sort of um, cultural uh, phenomenon is associated solely with, with mankind. But evidently, God created a whole lot of hominids before he created us. So we look very similar to those hominids, and I don't know the reason why he would do that. Maybe it's because he was preparing getting the animals used to having these hominid creatures around that were going to start to use them to do different things. I don't know the answer, but clearly God created them before he created us. But there's a big difference between them and us because we are created with the ability to have a relationship with God, and evidently they were not. So, oh, um, caveman was more like creature than man? That's correct. I have a question. Um, the, so I'm trying to understand the word bara, mm -hmm. you know, means like created versus, you know, let it be seen. And like when you were talking about how when God made man out of the dust of the earth, mm -hmm. it kind of reminded me of the story of the blind, when Jesus healed the blind man, when he spat in the clay yeah. and he made the eye. Mm -hmm. Would that be considered a bara because he's creating something new, the eye, which was not there before? Or you mean that... when, he, when you're talking about when he healed the guy? Yeah, but like he created the eye, like he made an eye because he had no eyes, mm -hmm. from what I know. Would that be considered like bara? Um, I'm not sure if if uh, if there if he had no eyes. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's clear in the scripture. Okay. Uh, it seems as though he rubbed. He, he you know he yeah. made some. Uh, uh, took the clay of the ground and he rubbed it into into the guy's eyes, it says. I don't think it said that he had no eyes, but okay. 
Um, it's an interesting question. Bara is an important word because it really means that something comes into existence that did not exist before. There's many things that we read about in the creation account where it was already there, but God just allows it to be seen versus something that's absolutely brand new. And what's, what's the question that's really interesting is how many times does bara actually occur? And it only occurs three times in all of Genesis 1. The creation of the universe, the creation of, uh, of, um, of the animals, and the creation of human beings. That's the only time it's used. Okay, so thanks very much, everyone. That was a great session, and we'll see you again next time.